what I'd like to do today is continue the conversation we started about experiment design. Um, but before we go into it, let me do a brief refresher. Uh, so I'd like to ask um, for a quick summary of things we talked about last time on Tuesday. We talked about so two kinds of designs, two fundamental kinds of designs of experiments with different trade-offs. What were they and what were the trade-offs? Anybody? I don't remember the names, but I think I can remember the general concept. So one would be if you have multiple uh, participants, you give each participant one single treatment. And let's say you have three treatments, right? You might need to have um, at least three different participants to try out each um, treatment that you have. So the pros of this is that I think you there's no like learning effects or there's no um, other confounding factors that might kind of in, that might skew the results in a certain way. Um, I think the downside is that you have to do a lot more recruitment to get a satisfiable number of samples. And on top of the fact that um, there's definitely another con that I was just thinking of, but we'll return to that later. The other study design that you might have is you have one particular, oh, sorry, I'll go back to the downside. I think there might be individualized learning factors that might actually play into uh -huh. um, the, this sort of experimental setup more. The other setup that we talked about was you have one participant that does all end treatments at once. Um, and so the benefits of this is that um, it normalizes for learning individual learning factors across the treatments. Um, so reduces that confounding factor. Um, but it does introduce also a lot of other um, factors like fatigue or learning biases or uh, sorry, learning yeah, effects. We factors. call them learning effects. Yeah, yeah learning effects. Um, so that is a downside, but um, it does mean that you do have less participants needed to get a satisfaction. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was great. So um, we're talking about a between subjects or between groups design. That was the first one you mentioned, right? And we call that between subjects or groups because um, every condition is, so every participant only uh, takes part in one experimental condition. So we observe the differences in conditions between subjects. That's where the name comes from. Uh, the other one is called within subjects, right? So we administer multiple conditions to the same subjects or groups. This is one big thing to remember about, you know, two fundamental kinds of designs between subjects versus within subjects. And we talked about those trade-offs that you summarized. Um, thank you. Um, and then we talked about something uh, specifically about within subjects designs. We talked about some clever strategy to um, uh, deal with some of these learning effects or order effects. What was the clever strategy? Someone else. Thank you, Jenny. So learning, to remind you, learning effects were about um, people getting better over time as they you know, participate in more conditions uh, and you falsely attributing their improvements in performance perhaps to the conditions instead of to just you know, the fact that they've learned to be better at the task at hand, irrespective of the actual condition. Um, and then there was also fatigue, which kind of was in the opposite order, uh, which is about, you know, like the more you ask of people, the more tired and more mistakes they'll get. Uh, so you expect them to do worse towards the maybe end of the experiment, because I don't know, they get bored and tired. Uh, so these are two kinds of effects, order effects, both of them, that have to do with the order in which you present the tasks and the conditions. So Matt. Change the order? Yes. So we call this what? What we use a term for this counterbalancing. counterbalancing. That's a good term to remember. Counterbalancing is the strategy of breaking down your participants into multiple groups, subgroups, and then changing the order of the conditions uh, between these different subgroups. Uh, and we talked about a specific kind of design, a clever design for counterbalancing. What was it? Yes. Uh, the Latin square, like the matrices where you have like different orders. That's right, the Latin square design. So here, here is a uh, representation of the Latin square design. There it is. There's the Latin square design. 
Okay, so the idea here was that um, every row, every row is a group of participants, and the row represents the order in which you present the tasks or the conditions to them. Um, and every row has one condition, every condition appear once, every column has every condition appear once. And this is a way to counterbalance the conditions here so that you know some people get to do them in one order, other people get to do them in the opposite order. Uh, and this would sort of hopefully cancel out the different order effects. Okay. And I showed you an example. I just want to uh, bring this back uh, briefly to remind you of this. I showed you this example of three test conditions, A, B, and C, a bunch of participants in the different conditions. Um, and so three groups of participants that were assigned these test conditions in different orders. First group did ABC, second group did BC and A, third group did CAB, according to the Latin square design. Um, and I showed you, or I guess I didn't show you. So let, let, me, let me repeat this uh, one more time because I don't know if my explanation on Tuesday was clear enough. So hopefully I can do a better job today. So what you're seeing here is um, the, what is the value here? Mean task completion time. So this is sort of the outcome measure you're tracking in the experiment. The faster they complete the task, the better uh, in principle. So lower is better. So you can see, for example, if you compare, say, the mean task completion time for group one, when they did task A first, so that's the thing over here. They did task A first. And these are, so for every participant, these are their you know, mean task completion times. And I further summarized this one more time. And that's the mean across the participants in that group. So 15 and some seconds, say. Um, and you could see, for example, that when they did task A second after C, they started with C and then they did A second. Here, their mean task completion time, you know, for the other group is somewhat lower than the first one. So you see perhaps evidence of learning, learning effects, right? People have gotten better at just, you know, uh, they've gotten into the flow of things, they've gotten better at uh, typing or whatever they're doing. Uh, and you see that they are, uh, you know, faster with this A method, right? Because they've learned something by doing C first, uh, and that uh, helps them do A faster, you know, once they have had that experience. Okay, so that's one. Um, you could also see perhaps a fatigue effect in this example. Right. So now, if I compare again, so, you know, doing A first in group one with doing A last in group two, you see that now group two is taking a lot longer to do the same task than the first group is. And, uh, you know, maybe because of fatigue, maybe that's what we're seeing. Okay, so you're seeing, you know, both examples of learning effects, perhaps, as well as fatigue effects, the two kinds of order effects we talked about. Um, and here's the, the catch, right, the million dollar question or a trick. If you look at the overall means of these different groups, you see that they're more or less the same. We are not talking about you know statistically significant differences in any of that right now, uh, so, but you know they look about the same. Okay, um, so you can see from this analysis, this comparison, you can conclude that the counterbalancing worked, right? Be because this is what you would expect if whatever you know learning effects and fatigue effects would cancel each other out. You'd expect that. You know, when you look at this overall as a whole, right, those differences should go away, and they do. Does that make sense? So this is a way for you to confirm, to test if the counterbalancing actually worked, right? Which is a good thing. But right? you want it to work. That's why you do it. You want it to work so that you can, you know, cancel out these learning effects and order uh, fatigue effects, order effects in general. You want to cancel those out, 
And you can be confident, say, if this was your data, that you succeeded at doing that um, because you can see that uh, they kind of cancel each other out uh, in this analysis of comparison of means. Does this make sense? So this was the first thing we talked about on Tuesday, okay? showing that counterbalancing worked. And then I showed you this other example, which was very confusing towards the end. So I want to bring this back. We talked about how, you know, as much as we like the, this 11 square design in general, if you think about it more closely, um, you could see that the uh, conditions precede and follow other conditions an unequal number of times, the way we've specified this uh, matrix. So here you see that the AB order is more frequent than the BA order. Okay. So like a fundamental assumption of what we did previously in the previous example is that these order effects cancel each other out. Okay, that's why counter counterbalancing works if the order effects cancel each other out, but they might not, especially if you do, you know, tasks, one of the conditions, one of the orders, one of the sequences is much more frequent than the other one, right? So if there's some systematic bias there, it will show up even more, okay? And I tried to show you this example and I wanna bring this back. Um, so here they were, this is an actual, uh, this is actual real data from a published paper. They're comparing two scanning keyboards. We talked about what scanning keyboards are. So uh, this is especially for people with disabilities. You first, uh, so the, the keyboard scans through uh, rows first, and you know, you the user stop on which row you want to select the letter from, and then it scans over columns scans horizontally and you the user stop on the letter you want to select and then it sort of resets and keeps scanning again and this is how you type through by selecting one letter at a time and the two conditions here were this basic default scanning keyboard and a fancier version of the same that adds predictive sorry that adds um what do they call them word predictions for frequent words, much like your, I don't know, uh, smartphone keyboard suggests, you know, the complete words uh, when you're typing, I don't know, text messages or something, and you don't have to type the whole thing, you just tap on the word that gets suggested. So same idea. Okay. So this would be a way potentially, you know, to not have to type every single letter in a word, right? You know, if, if the word you're actually trying to type is one of the words that gets suggested, su uh, suggested, I'm sorry, you just go and select that word, okay? So they were comparing people's typing speeds with these two keyboards, um, and they followed this counterbalancing strategy in Latin square design. So they had two groups of people. Uh, you see them over here, group one and group two, two groups of people, uh, whatever, type different words, with these different keyboards and different orders. The first group did the uh, default letters only keyboard first, followed by the fancier one with word prediction. And the second group did them in the op opposite order, started with the fancier keyboard with word prediction, followed by the default basic one without word prediction. Okay, so the one, the yellow keyboard highlighted here corresponds to these highlighted cells there. Okay, this is the example. So now we looked at how, if you just compare the typing speed across keyboards, they were indistinguishable. Okay, so if you just look at this, you would conclude that, you know, there is no difference in typing speed between the two keyboards, right? You are not say faster with the fancy keyboard that has word prediction. You're just as fast with that on average as you are with the basic default keyboard, right? There'll be one conclusion here. Okay? Um, if you compare the 
uh, you know, outcome measures for the first half of the experiment with the outcome measures for the second half of the experiment. So going back to this, comparing across, uh, comparing the two columns, right? The first half with the second half, okay? You see uh, a clear increase in typing speed in the second half, right? Meaning everybody got faster in the second half compared to the first half. Okay. So this would indicate the learning effect, right? The same kind we talked about before, but right? people just get better at typing. So, you know, it doesn't really matter which keyboard they're using. They all just get to type faster because they're more experienced or whatever in the flow of typing. Um, and the catch was this plot where uh, you could see that if instead of comparing the two columns, you compare the diagonals, you compare the groups, sorry, you compare the rows, not the diagonals, um, you see a difference in typing speeds here. So um, the first group was able to overall type faster than the second group. Okay, so let me go back to this. First group started with the basic keyboard and moved on to the fancy one. This group typed faster overall than the group that started in the opposite order on average. Okay. This is really interesting because it indicates this sort of asymmetrical skill transfer. But so there's something fundamental here about starting with the basic keyboard and moving up to the fancy one, right? That gives you more benefit somehow than doing this in the opposite order. If you start with a fancy keyboard and then downgrade to the basic one, that is overall worse. Okay, so that was really interesting. Um, and I wanna show you this plot so illustrating the same point again. So here, um, on the x-axis, you have the, the, you know, which half you're in, the first half or the second half. On the y-axis, you have the outcome measure, the typing speed. Um, and you see, for example, the two devices that we talked about. You see the, um, the basic keyboard is the letters only. That's the blue circle. And the fancy keyboard with word prediction is the one with the red square. No, this should, okay. Um, and you could see, so if I'm just looking at say group one, uh, you could see that, you know, people get better over time, right? They type faster in the second half. I could conclude the same thing about group two. They get faster over time, right? They're faster in the second half. Even maybe they're faster at similar rates. So, you know, they seem to be getting better at about the same rate between the, the two groups. Um, um, and you could see that, it's harder to start with the fancier keyboard, right? That's the blue square, overall lower typing speed okay? compared to the basic keyboard. But the situation is reversed at the end, right? There's higher efficiency eventually with the fancier keyboard compared to the basic one. So you see this super interesting, you know, switch here, this crossover between the two lines, right? Indicating this asymmetric skill transfer, right? That people, you know, starting with the basic keyboard and moving up to the fancier one, get more benefit out of this experience than the other way around, right? So you know, one hypothesis, the, the authors were talking about this, um, the, the book author was talking about this, one hypothesis is that, um, you know, there's some uh, learning curve to learning how to use the fancy keyboard with word prediction, in addition to whatever learning curve there is to just learning how to type with a scanning keyboard in the first place, maybe for study participants. So, um, you know, if you, if you start people off with the basic keyboard, they don't get confused by the additional complexity of the word prediction part. And they just get to use, they learn how to use the interface overall. And then it's easier for them to transfer into this extra feature of word prediction. If you start them in the opposite order, there's more complexity 
right? Maybe too much complexity in the beginning. They have to learn both how to use a scanning keyboard as well as how to navigate the predictions. And that just makes it harder to, you know, to learn. So you see less of this, you know, a, a benefit in the beginning. But you see more benefit as people become more fluent with this. So a super interesting way of, uh, you know, showing these asymmetric skill transfers between uh, conditions. Okay, so this is where we left off. The other reason I showed you this example is uh, because it will tie into something we call interaction effects in a minute. Uh, but let me let me pause for a second and see if there's any thoughts or questions. And hopefully my explanation today was clearer than the one on Tuesday. I know at least Eli was confused about this on Tuesday. Any thoughts or comments or questions? Yeah, thank you for the explanation today, Bogdan. That um, really helped me understand. Me as well. Yeah, I was confused too on Tuesday. But thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so then let's talk about sort of going more, a little bit deeper into this still. What if you want to test more than one independent variable at a time? We sort of did that. We sort of did that here implicitly. I don't know that they wanted to do this by design. Uh, they sort of ended up doing this. They sort of ended up testing you know, both the device itself, the type of keyboard, as well as the order uh, in which you start using it. They ended up testing basically two variables, maybe not by design, maybe it was an accident. Uh, but how might we do this in general? Well, the, uh, the typical way is to use the so-called factorial designs. So that's basically what the name implies. It's all combinations of conditions. Okay, so if I have, you know, say a device with two treatments, I don't know, a basic or a fancy, and I don't know, experience with two treatments, novice versus expert, how many groups do I need? It's not a trick question. I need to cover all combinations of these possible va uh, values of these variables. So if it's two by two, how many do I need? Four. That was not a trick question. Okay, if it's two by three, how many do I need? Six. Okay, we could do arithmetic, very good. Um, so let me show you an example. So let's say we are, you know, we're kind of talking in the same realm, typing speed, we're testing how uh, quickly people can type. And we, the experiment is set up to uh, test this, as a function of experience, you know, say novices versus experts, um, and you know, two types of device, maybe I don't know, a, a mouse versus trackpad or something like that. In my example here, if you see a, so this is a, a visualization similar to the ones we saw earlier um, of the uh, measurements of the outcome variable uh, in these different conditions. You see the four conditions here, two by two. What do you conclude? From this, if I show you this, if this is what it looks like, what do you conclude? Um, is there any an effect of the device people are using on their typing speed? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? Raise your hands on Zoom or in the classroom. A few. Who thinks no? Who does not have an opinion? Okay, why yes, Ian? I think I'm more inside than actually, I guess. So, the question I'm asking is, you know, does the device matter? Does the device have an effect on the typing speed? That's your research question, say. And I'm looking for a yes or no answer based on this data. Uh, Luke. 
I would say yes, um, because in, in both cases, I guess if you can control for the um, experience, so for both in the novice case, there is no cut, and in the experience case, it seems like, the numbers on the site, but it's a very similar effect, uh, that uh, controlling novice can only vary that variable increases in effect. Controlling the experience can only vary um, and we see this across both novice and experience. So I would conclude that it does. Okay, so Luke says it does have an effect um, and he's overthinking it, I think, <laughs> right? Um, just look at the, the difference in colors, assuming they are legible. Um, the red lines, sorry, the red data points for the mouse condition are both higher typing speed than the blue data points for the touchscreen conditions. Right? And the folks on Zoom agree with this assessment. Right, so it's always faster to type or whatever with the mouse than with the track touch screen. Sorry. Right, so to my question, is there an effect of device categorically? Right, the mouse is faster based on this data. Okay. Is there an effect of experience? Does it matter if you're a novice or an expert? Yes or no? Raise your hands if you think yes. Lots of yeses. Raise your hands if you think no. Why no? Yes, because it, it seems like the difference in effect is the same. Like there's the baseline um, level of skill that makes a difference, but the difference between uh, in typing speed between each device is, seems to be the same. Why yes? Someone that said yes. Someone on Zoom, let's see. I saw a bunch of hands with yes on Zoom. Why yes? Uh, Eli. Uh, I think that experience does have an effect on typing speed because the more experienced people categorically type faster than the novice people. Does that make sense? So in the previous, thank you, like in the previous um, question, we were grouping by color, right? And we were uh, deciding whether red is higher than blue, right? Because that was the device question. And this question, we're grouping by column, right? Novices, oops, sorry, here. Novices on the left hand side, experts on the right hand side, right? Grouping by column. So I'm going to say probably yes. There is an effect of experience. The uh, experts type faster than the novices with either device. Yeah? Do you buy this? Okay, so now trick question. Is there an interaction effect between device and experience? In other words, what kind of variable would that indicate? We talked about some M words on Tuesday. Two M words, what do we call them? It's gonna be on the quiz. Jenny. Mediators. Mediators and moderators. We talked about those kinds of variables on Tuesday. Which one are we talking about here? Should there be an, an interaction between them? Let me specify. So what I mean by interaction is, would say the effect of the device on typing speed vary with user experience? Or does it? Does the effect of device on typing speed vary with user experience? Yes or no?
who thinks yes? A few hands in the room. Who thinks no? A few hands in the room and on Zoom. Why yes? Somebody that said yes, please explain. Thank you for voting on Zoom as well. Why yes? Walk us through the reasoning. How did you arrive at the conclusion? I'm not very certain about this. No so this is just a complete yeah. guess. But I was kind of looking at the rate of changes. Um, like the like the it's I guess like sorry, I can't explain this. So the novice jumps. I didn't think about something. I was looking at the novice numbers and they were jumping from 15 to 20 um, based on you know the different devices. Yep. And looking at experienced people, they're jumping from 25 to 30. Yep. And they're both increases of five, but I looked at a proportional increase as opposed to sort of like absolute value increases. And so proportionally, like there's a significant increase. I don't know, actually, now I think about it, I don't know why I normalized it. Um, I just felt like I, I just did that intuitively, but I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Why no? What's the argument for no? Can somebody argue for no? I guess um, the argument for no is that the uh, basically that the distance of five is the same across um, all uh, experienced categories so the same for experienced categories. That is, unless you consider the percentage increase. Okay, yeah. So here's how we think about this. Oh, ah, yeah. Uh, so let me repeat the question, Maddie. The question was Does the effect of device we, we agreed earlier that there is an effect of device on typing speed, right? The mouse people type faster, we agreed on that. And I'm asking, does the effect of device on typing speed vary with experience? Meaning, you know, so everybody gets a benefit from using the, the mouse on typing speed, we've agreed that much, but do novices get a different benefit than the experts and vice versa is the question. Um, so, you know, we would look at the benefit, well, the absolute, I think, benefit uh, the novices get. So they start at 20 and, sorry, they start at 15 and they end up at uh, 20, right? So that's a benefit of five. The Experience, the experts start at 25 and they end up at 30. That's a benefit of five. So I would say no, right? It, it does not matter, right? What experience level you're at, right? So it does not change the magnitude of the effect of switching from a touch screen to a mouse. If you're a novice versus an expert. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna say here, where's the, there. So I'm gonna say there is an effect of experience, we agreed, right? So experts type faster. There is an effect of device, we agreed on that in the beginning, the mouse is faster, and there's no interaction between the two, right? It does not vary, like one, the effect of one on, on typing speed does not vary with the magnitude of the other. Right, so we're saying there is no interaction between the two. Okay, uh, what's this? Is there an effect of device? Device on typing speed? Yes, type, device on typing speed. Is there an effect of device on typing speed? Yes or no? No. No, because the curves, the know. lines look exactly the same. <laughs> because the lines look exactly the same, because the mouse and the touch screen values are indistinguishable. So there is no effect of device. Okay. Is there an effect of experience? Yes or no? Yes or no? 
Yes. Yes. Right? Because the experts type faster than the novices. We're comparing the columns. Is there an interaction? You know, does the effect of device, but well, there is no effect of device. Wait, yes, there is no effect of device. What about the other way around? Does the effect of experience vary with device? No. I see mostly no's, right? The effect of experience is the same for the mouse people and the touchscreen people. Right, so uh, experience, yes, has an effect on typing speed. Device, no, right? And there's no interaction. What about this? What, what is this? Does device have an effect on typing speed? Yes or no? The zoom, the zoom is on fire, I'm telling you. <laughs> the zoom is happening. Yes, right? Most definitely. The mouse line is above the touch screen line. Most definitely. There is an effect of device on typing speed. The mouse is faster. Okay. Um, and there's no effect of experience, right? Because the novices and the experts type at the same rate in both conditions. Is there an interaction? Maybe a little, Vasu says maybe a little, maybe just a teeny tiny, um, too small to believe anything. It's a fluke. So I'm, Mostly no, mostly, mostly no. Uh, point taken, yeah, I, I'm not gonna be pedantic. I randomly generated these values. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of jitter there, but uh, yeah, mostly no. Um, okay, so uh, here's a clear example of the interaction, so just to get you used to reading these plots. So here, you know, we're seeing that novice users can select targets faster with a touch screen, the blue line, compared to a mouse. Experienced users can select targets faster the other way around with a mouse rather than a touch screen. And the target selection speed for both the mouse and the touch screen increase as the user gains more experience with the device, right? So, you know, experts select targets faster always compared to novices in both conditions, but the increase in speed is larger for the mouse than the touch screen. In other words, the red line Sorry, yes, the red slope is steeper. The red line is steeper than the blue one. Okay. So the, we're concluding from this that you know, there is an interaction between device and experience, right? Because the relationship between device and typing speed varies with experience or similarly, the relationship between experience and typing speed varies with device. It goes in both directions. Okay. All right. What's this? Is there an effect of device? Vasu says yes on Zoom, but we cannot really trust them. <laughs> Why yes, Vasu?
Sorry, you're asking device? Device on experience, oh, sorry, so device on typing speed. Is there an effect of device on typing speed? Uh, I would say so since for both, um, for both classes of experience, there is a noticeable difference in typing speed. Not what I'm asking. I'm asking. Well, I, I, I when I'm asking about device, I expect that you would, um, you know, av average the device values. Uh, sorry, average the typing speed values for mouse, and compare them to the average of the typing speed values for touch screen. And. In this example, I'm going to counter argue that those two averages would be the same. Yeah, that's that's fair. So you know, if I if I ask you just this, is there an effect of device by itself on typing speed? You will probably tell me no. Right? What if I ask you now? Is there an effect of experience on typing speed? What would you tell me? Awesome. Vasu has learned his lesson and votes no this time. <laughs> also no, for a similar reason, right? If I average uh, the novice values and compare them to the average of the experience values, they're the same. Okay. So there's no effect of device on typing speed, and there's no effect of experience on typing speed, but, but what? There is an interaction. Isn't that really weird? Isn't that amazingly weird? Mind, I should have used the mind blowing emoji instead. I'm gonna fix this. Like that makes no sense. Uh, how is that possible? Right? You know, you could, I can, I can show you this, I'll show you this next time. You know, statistically, I will show you that there is no effect or, of device or experience of typing speed, but there is a statistically significant interaction between the two. Isn't that super weird? Mind blown, seriously. Like I, I was so excited, I, I told Bobo about this before class. I was so excited when I learned this the other day. Like I've never seen a real world example of this before where this happens. I, I didn't think this was possible, but yeah, there it is. There you have it. Jenny. Do we have an explanation for the interaction? Or like why the interaction occurs? But... Well, so the, the the rate at which things uh, you know change is exactly the opposite, you know, when you when you interact them. They, they cancel each other out. That's basically the idea. So it's no different really from sorry, uh, from this example, right? Where you know, depending on the value of experience, the magnitude of the effect of device on typing speed changes. It's no different really from this, right? Except it's like completely reverses, right? So it makes it seem like the effects of the individual first order things, device and experience, it seem, makes it seem like those go away entirely. Like they do not exist. So it's a, it's, you know, a gimmick really, but I thought it was really cool. Okay, so this was uh, very exciting. And actually, let me pause here for a second and I wanna to switch to the papers. I think we have at least two for today, is that true? I know Ian was one, who was the other one? Luke did the honor. Yeah, so let's, let's do that next. Let's do the papers next, because right, this was fun. Um, which one did you do, Ian? I did the double blind and single blind peer review. The uh, new rips or the other one? It was the PNAS. I did the neurops. So you did the data mining and whatever? Yeah, let's let's do yours first. Mine or? Yeah, yours. Let's okay. do yours first. Okay. By sharing. 
Yeah, I think if you could join the Zoom call, that would be ideal. And I will try to mute and stop sharing the screen from here. Hey everyone. Hey everyone. Is that still echoing? Doesn't seem like it. Can people hear me fine? Awesome. Sounds good. So the paper that I read to present on is reviewer bias in single versus double blind peer review. Um, wait, should we have it up there too? Oh, yeah, or? yeah. Very good. No problem. Sounds good. So there are three theoretical frameworks that the authors of this study used to examine bias. These effects are first that of gender. So whether or not peer reviewers are likely to review papers differently based on the gender of the authors. Then fame, so depending on the, um, the, the prestige of the institution or of the authors themselves. Um, and then, yeah, so institutional reputation is sort of considered as separate, but both can be sort of bundled under that overarching category. And the context for this study in particular was submissions to a particular ACM conference focusing on web search and data mining. And the way this study originated was that two of the authors were co-chairs of this conference and were asked to consider whether or not to implement double blind reviewing for the 2018 iteration of the conference versus single blind, where single blind had been used historically. So the way that this worked was you have these two authors who have considerable control over the way that peer review will then work in this conference. So they ran both types of peer review simultaneously. So what they did was they took the program committee and split them into two groups of roughly equal size, where one group was only reviewing in sort of single blind fashion. So they were able to see the author's names and affiliations. And then another group was reviewing in double blind fashion. So only able to see the content of the paper, but none of the authors identifying information. And for each paper that was submitted to the conference, you had two reviewers from each of these categories, each reviewer submitting a review with their given restrictions. And to sort of cover both this, this structure of, of how this process works, you have an initial bidding stage where you have the entire pool of reviewers selecting which papers they would like to review based on the title and content and their perceived level of expertise. 
So during the bidding process and the reviewing process, you had that same separation of information. So single blind reviewers could see authors, institutions, and um, names and affiliations during both bidding and reviewing, while those who were in the double blind group never saw any of that information whatsoever. So then taking these reviews, each individual paper was sort of um, assigned different numerical scores by the reviewers. So these fit the sort of strong accepts to strong reject model for one of these scores, as well as a paper ranking. So it would be one if you think that this paper is the like best or one of the best papers you have reviewed in this conference and is just amazing. And a four would be that it's generally in the bottom 50% of the papers that you'd reviewed. So the first metric is sort of like paper by paper. Then the second one is overall in every paper that you have looked at. And then, so th these were the scores provided by reviewers. And then the authors of the study and the chairs sort of cat categorized each paper separately from the reviewers based on various data points. So in this case, um, whether or not a paper was produced by an academic institution or not, whether or not the author or authors were female or male, this seemed to be manually annotated, which is sort of problematic because naming, but um, anyway. Then whether or not a paper is written in the US, whether or not a paper was written by a famous author, which they described as having like three accepted papers from past conferences um, within that sort of iteration, or if they had like, or and in addition, having like 100 total papers um, in any conference. Then also same country. So if a reviewer and an author of a paper share the same sort of cultural background, whether that could influence reviewing, whether or not a university is listed as a top university, which they listed as being um, sort of from this particular ranking. And then also whether or not the paper was published sort of by a top comp company. So whether or not it had some sort of um, corporate or or origin versus being a academic paper. Um, and then you also have then sort of this quality metric that was assigned, which aggregates the numeric numerical data that we saw previously. So um, the, Whoops, I didn't advance, or at least it looks like, whoa. That's okay. Sorry, we're having problems in the, I'm not sure if people can see my screen still in Zoom. Yeah, it just killed my Zoom entirely. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Now that's working. Huh. Anyway, so each paper also received this sort of. Let me make sure it's not frozen still. Yep, that seems like it's good. Okay, so then to sort of summarize the quality of papers as reviewed and compare it with these different sort of um, categorizations, you they calculated a quality score not based on the single blind reviewers, but based on the double blind reviewers. Um, and sort of just to summarize the results that were found here in comparing the, uh oh, it looks like it's frozen again. Or not, maybe. There we go. <laughs> okay, so to summarize in, in comparing quality of papers versus um, or under um, double blind peer review, as well as looking at the behaviors of the single blind reviewers, he found that um, single blind reviewers um, bid less, but bid in the bids that they did place um, on average were more to papers from top universities or companies than the double blind reviewers. And for those reviews, um, they were more likely to review papers positively, or at least more more positively than the double blind reviewers did um, if that paper was published by sort of one of these top authors, companies, or universities. Thank you. Any thoughts on the
it seems like people may have to review a lot more. Smartphone connected. Is there sound on Zoom? Uh, now I can hear it. Elijah, any any progress on sound on Zoom since you mentioned? Oh, I see some nods from Eli. That was for the sound, right, Eli? Not again? Okay. All right, thank you. So I was asking, you know, if you have any commentary on the overall, you know, study design or the experimental design. It seems fairly straightforward in that the authors had quite a bit of control over the, like the, they had very much like separate groups of reviewers. Um, and I think in, in general, the, the amount of control that they had as members of the program committee made it so that at least in terms of like how the reviews were assigned, how information was given, like seemed to have been done flawlessly. I think that a few of their um, sort of qualitative categorizations were a bit flawed though in the sense that I think like um, assigning gender from someone's name is kind of a, a problematic thing, um, which it seemed from whatever call that they had done. Um, and then also the ranking for top universities, um, I mean, is like just one particular website, which they acknowledge in the paper is like a flawed metric, but that they, like I, I, they didn't justify that enough. Um, I think that the top conference or top um, author was fairly like rigorously defined, but I think top institution could have been defined in a similar way uh -huh. in terms of papers from that institution committed to that conference versus just like an online meeting. But aside from that, in terms of the experimental design, I, I don't have any problems with it. I thought it was like really like. It was kind of almost how I would expect it to be. Because there was random assignment yeah. in the right places, and we sort of believed that that would account for, you know, confounding factors sufficiently. Yeah. yeah. Any Anybody else thought about this or has any comments or questions? By the way, the size of the effect was in the order of 2x for all of those. So, you know, papers from top institutions about twice as likely to get accepted over bottom institutions. Papers from famous authors about twice as likely to be accepted compared to infamous authors, et cetera. So like, all of those were in the order of 2x, if I remember the details correctly. Is that true? Yes. Cool. Okay. One uh, side comment. So we are these days uh, encouraged to use the terminology double anonymous or single anonymous instead of double blind, uh, just because you know one is considered maybe somewhat pejorative to people with vision impairments. Uh, but yeah, this was you know before we had uh, the paper came out before I mean, the community had realized that it's more appropriate terminology to use. So Thank you. yeah, we'll see that. No, I I didn't know either at the time. Yeah. So no worries. Sorry, did you have to um, we're you yeah so the uh, advice is to use double anonymous or single anonymous versus double or single blind just be more you know uh, accurate in terms of what's actually happening uh, okay uh right thank you ian uh luke do you want to go next i suspect
I'm no longer muted. Okay. Can somebody on Zoom indicate that the mute is audible? Can you hear me? Anybody on Zoom? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, we're getting thumbs ups. So I'm going to take that as a good sign. OK. Um, uh, so I read um, uh, the NeurIPS experiment article. Uh, so this was uh, just like the last one, um, another uh, article uh, looking at um, uh, review practices. Uh, the research question for this was a little bit different. Um, it's uh, how random uh, is the conference uh, review process? Uh, so uh, they, the article um, authors make this uh, comment that uh, when whenever we get a paper accepted, we we think of this as um, a uh, confirmation that our work is uh, meaningful and good. Um, but if we get a paper rejected, uh, we console ourselves with the notion that conferences are are random. Uh, the review process is random. Uh, so which is it? Uh, and that's that's what this um, study is, is uh, here to figure out. Uh, so uh, just like the, the previous um, uh, paper that we discussed, uh, this experiment was done uh, at a conference. It didn't move forward. I'm on the next slide. How strange. There it goes. I didn't touch my computer. It moved on. How strange. Um, uh, so uh, just like the... Um, uh, just like the previous paper, uh, this was um, done um, at, a, at a major conference, in this case, NeurIPS. Um, the uh, program committee um, was split into two separate program committees, uh, each of which, I'm sure this wasn't entirely random. Uh, they didn't mention uh, this, but I'm sure like each had the appropriate number of um, experts in each subject area so they could each evaluate papers. Uh, but papers were randomly split um, between um, uh, program committees. Most were only evaluated by one program committee, uh, but um, each program committee was given, each given um, 166 papers. Uh, an interesting detail here uh, is that each program committee was tasked with accepting 22.5% of them. Uh, so they sort of had this quota that they had to meet, um, this, this particular number. Uh, and um, after reviewing, they compared uh, which which papers um, were accepted. Uh, so unlike the last study where they they looked at a, a few more um, variables and a few more um, different pieces of data, here they're just looking at if, if uh, papers are either accepted or rejected. Uh, and theoretically, each program committee um, is using the exact same evaluation criteria. Uh, so this the experiment was was. Um, uh, set up uh, in, in roughly this way using the notation we used in class, except I think we actually used R's instead of A's and B's. Uh, similar, so similar notation. Um, so in a, in a standard experiment, um, you usually apply some sort of treatment uh, to uh, one group um, and not to another group. And of course, we talked about other ways you can do this. Um, you can have a placebo, placebo group as well or many other things. Um, but sort of the unique thing about the NERPS experiment uh, is that they're challenging the basic assumption that um, the, these two groups, which are roughly randomly split out, um, are the same. Uh, and in this case, um, the, it actually turned out not to be the case. Um, the two program committees disagreed on acceptance and rejection in 25.9% um, of the papers, which doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but because of this sort of artificial um, uh, restriction that they can only that they had to accept 22.5% of the papers, uh, this means that they disagreed on 57% of them. Uh, so even if they completely disagreed on which papers to accept, they would still um, agree on the 55% of papers to project sort of just by the way the quota forces them to do that. Uh, so this is, this is um, a little bit uh, surprising. Um, this indicates that uh, the uh, acceptance process is fairly random. Um, they disagreed on 50% of 57% of papers um, that were accepted, uh, which isn't uh, as bad as a purely random committee, which would disagree on 77.5%. But this is um, does indicate that, that there's a fair amount of randomness in the process. Uh, so if you are consoling yourself on a um, paper rejection, uh, there are there's evidence that the uh, process is in fact random. <laughs> 
Thank you. Do you have any commentary on the study design of the whole? I think you're going to um, it, I think it made sense uh, for for this scenario. Uh, it's it's a fairly simple study design, um, but I think I think it works. Uh, I don't know if there's like any more data that they could have collected um, to make this uh, the results a little bit more rich. So perhaps they could have done something like the last um, uh, last experiment and see if maybe uh, I think this was a double anonymous um, uh, thing, but. Uh, see if, despite it being double anonymous, that maybe famous researchers are famous because, and I don't know if this relationship exists, but um, maybe famous researchers are famous because their um, papers are, are generally higher quality. Um, so it would be interesting to see if um, famous researchers do get their papers accepted by both groups more often. Uh, and we're sort of lacking that. But the, sort of the basic, just the basic thing of um, do different sets of reviewers agree on um, whether or not to accept a paper? It does a good job of establishing that uh, and gives a, I don't know if it's satisfying, but useful and informative result. Anybody have any more thoughts or comments on this? Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, so let me see if I can. Smartphone connected. Am I audible now instead of Luke? Yes. Yes, I see a nod. I'll take that as a sign of encouragement. And the screen is shared. Is that true? There is. Okay, All right. So let's see, what else do I have here? Yeah, that's about it here. Let me stop with this part. It is as good a time as any to talk about something else. Uh, okay, so small ask, I have, I asked a number of, I've asked this of you on the Slack channel. So I'm going to remind you. Uh, I don't want to see you all on there. I want to see you all on my side. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so one small ask um, if you have. I don't know, 30 seconds, please type in to the Slack channel because I won't be able to save the Zoom chat, I think. Please type into the Slack channel a invented sequence of zeros and ones that you come up with you know, manually like with your heads as opposed to, I don't know, writing a computer program to generate one for you. Just invent a sequence of 50 or more, doesn't matter, uh, random zeros and ones and write them down in the Slack channel. And I will tell you why next time. Bobo's laughing. Do you think it's gonna work? I've done it live and it worked. I mean, I've done it with an audience and it worked in the past. So I guess, I guess we shall see. Thank you. Uh, okay. The other thing we're going to talk about, yeah, we don't have a lot of time left. We're going to talk about more of these threats to validity, probably a little bit more next time. But let me just do one small thing. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about statistics a little bit. So let's say, you know, let's say you're 
doing an experiment to test some hypothesis okay, to see whether there is or not a difference in the mean time to complete some task using, say, Copilot or similar compared to writing code from scratch. Okay. Um, so, you know, you've run some experiment, you've collected some data from participants, I don't know, you've assigned them to uh, conditions randomly, et cetera, all of that, you've done all of this. So now you have a bunch of data for these different conditions, and you run some statistical tests to compare the two distributions of task completion times, say between people that use your fancy AI and people that don't. Okay. Uh, and you obtain some p-value uh, as a result of the, running that statistical test. Okay. What does that p-value indicate? Question. What does it tell you? How do you interpret the p-value relative to these hypotheses that you have, you know, uh, stated, which are are testing? Maybe look, let's see, let's see someone else, someone we haven't heard from. Luke seems too eager. Uh, Elijah. Can you hear me? Wait, there's no, I can't, hold on, I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? How about now? Can you hear me? Anything? Uh, can, no? Zoom, Zoom can hear you. Uh, okay. So <laughs> I guess the classroom can't. Okay. How about now? Okay. Can you hear me? I think we can hear you now. Okay. Um, so what a p-value represents is the probability that you would find what the, or find the difference in means if there take is. Take that back. Oh, okay. Let's try again. I swear this is going to be the end of me. Is this better? I'm speaking. Um, I'm going to assume not because Bogdan is not responding. Okay. How about now? Um, testing. How about now? Does this work? Can you hear me? Oh my God. Okay, yes. You can? I can hear you. Sorry about this. I have no idea what's happening. But I can okay. hear you. I forgot what the specific okay. context of the experiment was now, but um, did you still want me to say what a p value is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, where did my, there we go. Here's the question. So, How do we so interpret the p-value? The p-value is the probability that you would find the observations you have provided that there is no difference in the mean time to complete a task using NL code versus writing code from scratch. So is it the probability that the null hypothesis is true or is it? Yeah, it's the probability that the null hypothesis is true 
provided the data you have or whatever. Yeah. That's an important. I, isn't isn't that a bit imprecise? I I got the impression that it was more like that. The first thing you said was more accurate. That's like the probability you'll see something at least as weird as yeah. the observations you saw, given the model you have. Yeah, I mean, it's like the area under the curve to the left. So it's something as extreme as what you observe or more extreme, I guess. So it's a cumulative but rather it, than just a point. Estimate. But you can't say that it's the probability that some hypothesis yeah, is yeah. true because yeah. you're just saying that it's probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to I, say I agree. I have to this <laughs> argument and I fully attribute it. Weren't you both at the computational social science seminar? I'm just parroting stuff I learned in stats class in undergrad. Um, were, you, were you not having each unique box lunch at the competition? Ah, <laughs> uh, uh -huh, because I did too. Yeah, so I, let me end with this thing, and we're going to pick this up on Tuesday. This is a really important point that is very often confused. So, you know, this is one of those things that I tell you to put in your things to remember for the day, because it's one of those things that's really important. Um, so, you know, I, I guess what you, you know, would ideally like to think is that the uh, p-value you get indicates the probability that the result is due to chance. But that is unfortunately not the case. That is not true. Uh, what it actually represents is the probability, you know, that given a chance model and the, the whatever the uh, universe and the observe a model of the observations uh, results as extreme or more than the ones you have observed in your one experiment can actually occur. Which is quite different from the you know point inference from the first uh, interpretation, the probability of that particular result being due to chance or not. Uh, and you talked about this you know graphical depiction of the definition of p value, where you know it's basically this area under that you know, curve that represents the probability of observed outcomes. Um, and it's not just the sort of point value of that probability. Um, and I want to give you one example very quickly to illustrate this, if I can find my mouse. Yes, it was actually coming up very good. Okay, so um, let's say you're testing uh, if a coin is fair or not. Okay. So your null hypothesis is that the coin is fair, meaning the probabilities of uh, flipping tails or heads is the same as half. Okay. Uh, and you know, alternatively, the probability, uh, if the coin were biased, the probability of observing heads say would be different than half on average. Okay. So you toss one coin, what's the probability of observing heads if the coin is fair? Paolo? 50%, half. If you toss the coin again, What's the probability of observing a second head in a row? A quarter, right? If you keep tossing it, they by the fourth toss, the you know you keep halving like every time you keep halving this. So the probability of observing four heads in a row is about 
percent. Okay. So you know, let's say you do this two-sided. So you could do the same thing for tails as you did for heads. Um, it doesn't mean that the probability of the coin being fair is only 12.5% in that case, right? Even if you observe this, you know, four heads in a row, you might think that the coin is not fair, right? Or the probability that the coin is not fair is not 12.5%. So we're over. I'm going to pick this up. Think about p-values for uh, Tuesday. I don't want to keep you now. I'm going to pick this up on Tuesday uh, and stop here and take questions from Matt. Oh, we don't, do we? I... Huh, interesting. So we shall, yeah, we don't have class on fall break, right? Okay, so happy fall break. I will see you. Tuesday after fall break, which means we will have some homework assignments and quizzes and things. Okay. Just, uh, <laughs> right, because, okay. Yeah, so thank you for reminding me. Uh, happy fall break. Uh, see you, see you soon after that.